us because right. <laughs> my whole house is like torn up. Yeah. But it's getting there. So we are not live, but okay. we are recording, and I will just have to add it to our YouTube okay. channel. Okay, got it. No problem. Thanks for that update. The meeting will come to order. Let the roll call show that all members of the board are present. The first item is approval of the agenda. I will go ahead and move that we approve the agenda as presented. I second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Are there any opposed? The motion carries. Then we have the Pledge of Allegiance. Mr. Buckley, will you please lead us? I pledge to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We move on to informational reports, starting with a summary of current events from Dr. J. Madam President, members of the board and guests, thank you for being here tonight. Um, we've been uh, quite busy since our last meeting and uh, just had a couple things I thought I would share. So um, one of our big focus uh, points this year is on PBIS and uh, trying to make sure we roll that out with fidelity, making sure that we are um, getting it off on a good start. So um, one of the one of our uh, places that's really run with it is our middle school. So I'm very excited. I'm going to highlight them a little bit tonight. Uh, uh, special thanks to Dr. Will Dreyer um, and uh, Val Reichler and TJ and everyone up in the office. Um, they are completely off and running. They have uh, every day um, close to a thousand points being being uh, presented to kids throughout the, the day and the language and the, the, the different uh, tiers and categories and um, principles are being used all the time. Um, we're very excited about that. Um, they have an upcoming um, reward day that they're going to be doing, their first one, uh, which is exciting for the kids to be able to see that all the hard work and all the things they're doing is, is paying off. Um, but I'm really excited with just the attention to uh, detail uh, across the board. Uh, at, the middle, at the high school, they are implementing it now, and they are um, getting started. They've had uh, quite a few teachers getting on board, getting with it. Uh, one of the advantages the middle school has right now is, is Val is in charge of the PBIS program, and she's stationed at the middle school, so she has a lot more time to work on it there. But she has upcoming meetings scheduled with the high school and the elementary school. The elementary is not using the app. They're, they're using the Falcon Feathers. Uh, but they are, again, off and, and doing a good job teaching expectations, and kids are earning feathers and points. So I'm very excited with, with where PBIS is going. The other piece of this that's very nice is all the major and minor referrals are now tracked uh, through the program, and it allows for us to get really detailed reports of when we're seeing the most issues, what part of the school, what time, uh, what day of the week, and, and uh, things of that nature. So for administration and for site PBIS teams, it's going to be really good for them to see all that data and make decisions based on where they want to go with the school. So I feel like there's a very positive vibe. I've been in every school frequently. Um, I, I, I love that part of this job is to be able to go visit all the campuses. And uh, so uh, we, Chris and I have been out and about quite a bit. Uh, at, the, at the various sites providing support, but also just visiting with the kids and uh, stopping by classrooms. So uh, it's been great. So I'm very excited about where PBIS is going. We'll continue to give you updates. That's a big initiative this year that we're trying to really push hard on. Uh, I did get to go to my first athletic event back at the football game, and it was um, unique for me because uh, being in this role, but also as a parent and watching my own son play was kind of unique. Um, it was a great, great game. The best part for me coming into the game was that the band was playing, so I got a big smile on my face when I walked in because I know how much work went into <laughs> getting that done. And uh, it was just great to see Mr. Morales and the band uh, back up there in their usual spot and playing throughout the game. And they've not had a lot of uh, time and practice, but they sounded excellent. So it was, it was great to see that. Uh, very excited about our football program, where it's going, and uh, even though they came up a little short, they played really hard, and um, they, they definitely have what it takes to, to be successful. It'll just take a little more time for, for them, but I was very excited to see that. We have uh, other athletic events now starting to come up all the time, so I'll have uh, opportunities to go see those, but uh, it was great to see the community out. 
Um, pretty good sized crowd. The student section was, was loud and exciting. So um, I was very happy with that. Uh, I've had now three coffees or two, two or three, uh, about, but with the, with the superintendent. Um, great showing. We've had every, every one of them has been, almost every seat's been taken in the district conference room. And it's great that we've had members of the district team stop by. We've had site administrators come. Um, Chris and I are there each time. Krista's there to, to offer updates. We take feedback, and then the goal is the next time we have a meeting, we'll, the questions that we couldn't answer at the time, we'll bring back to them. But it's been, it's been good. I know Mr. Hartman had his first coffee. I was able to stop by and see that. So we're, we're seeing a lot of, um, you know, at the sites, parents and community being uh, uh, invited into the campus, which is really important for me. Uh, we launched our new IT services, and uh, we're, we have a, quite a backlog there, but we're, we're getting through it. Um, Chris is, special thanks to Chris Alexander, he is overseeing uh, a lot of the IT uh, movement uh, to the Fruth Group, but we've had great service from them, great customer service when we call, they're, they're right on things. And um, I think it'll take a couple of weeks for everyone to be trained and, and get to know our systems. And then from there, I think it will, it will be a, a huge success. You can now dial 5600 as a teacher or staff member, and it goes to the help desk, which is a new feature, which I really like. And then you can also uh, email helpdesk at fhacademics.org, and you will get um, a response back. I got two today. Uh, response back of has this been closed out or we're still working on this so I feel very strong with where we're going with with IT services um, and I've been just busy creating committees that's another thing I'm working hard on I just sent out a strategic planning committee um, we have our student advisory board set so we have 10 10 students that are representing from 9 through 12th grade and I'm excited about that group, and we're going to start meeting uh, at lunch for the first meeting and see what they're, if they want to be early morning and go bright and early or after school or they like the lunch period. I'm a little nervous because they can go off campus, a lot of them, so they may not want to do the lunch session, <laughs> whereas if they were on campus, it might be easier. But um, I'm very excited to get that one off and running, and then uh, we're just basically going through and, and setting up as many, as many committees as we can to get feedback and collaboration from our, our staff. So with that, I conclude my comments. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any questions or no, commentary? No, comments. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, comments. And we will move on to governing board reports, starting with you, Mrs. Reed. Um, I don't really have much to report, but I would just like to thank George and the Fountain Hills Times uh, for the um, stories that they're doing on our teachers. Uh, or, or staff, they did one on JC, which was very well received and well written. And uh, and then today it was about Jillian Levin, who is basically the third Levin to now work in our school district. And so it's just really great, George. Thank you for writing those to see our staff highlighted and to give the community an opportunity to read about the great employees that we have. So thank you for writing those. Mr. Sorry. Sir? <laughs> I stole your thunder. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, it, it's happened over the last 34 years, but it really needs it now, so good for you. All right, Dr. Bernard? Yep. I totally agree. The articles have been great. Oh, those Levens. I know. They're so adorable. Yeah, you need to All send of them. That. Yeah, you need to send them those pictures. Those are great. <laughs> um, so, um, Let's see, I did Falcon Fest, but I really ran in and out. I felt bad I did not, like, but it looked really organized and there were not long lines. A lot of times there's a lot of backlog. Um, so I probably could have gotten my picture taken because I wouldn't have had to stand in line. <laughs> um, and just even the way the Chromebooks were distributed, I know that sounds silly, but as a parent, it was almost seamless. Like you got your stuff, you got your paperwork, you did this, you walked up, you you knew like, everything was just very, very well organized. Um, and there were teachers there and uh, some staff, and everyone was very friendly and nice. And PTO was there, and coalition was there. So very nice. Um, and then there was a staff barbecue 
on Friday evening for staff and faculty that uh, Gridiron Club, Booster Club, and PTO helped with. And we had about 75 people RSVP, but I think with the rain, not everyone came. Mm -hmm. um, but everyone who did come was really excited and happy, and it was beautiful to have things set up in the cafeteria. It's actually VIP seating if we ever want to do anything with that because oh, over the field. You can, I mean, <laughs> it is such a nice view right onto the football field. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so thank you, PTO uh, and Booster Club, for helping with that. Um, and they've instituted something new. The coach, the football coach, has instituted something new called uh, Teacher of the Week at the high school. So, the football team, I want to say it's each grade level, uh, vote on their Teacher of the Week. And then they get recognized and get to wear a shirt. So, um, watch, watch. Uh, I Falcon saw Ms. Barsima had it. Of course, I. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I could probably name all the teachers that would get it for the next ten weeks. But yeah, uh, my, the sen seniors' picture. She's very deserving. Um, and then the pictures of the football players in the Palm Squad and the Falcon going to the elementary school. Oh my gosh, I love that so much. Mm -hmm. The kids get so excited. Mm -hmm. um, so that was really nice to see. Um, we are starting to organize for homecoming. Uh, brings back memories of sitting in uh, your office, Dr. J, <laughs> um, when you were principal. Mm -hmm. um, but it's moving along. Homecoming will be the 23rd, and we will be having a parade. Yep. Um, 23rd of? Of September, September, I'm sorry. Yes, 23rd of September. Um, so the parade will, so that we don't have to pay to close down streets, because that is very expensive. Let the record show. I don't know if everybody knows <laughs> that, but um, when, we have to, when we used to do the parade, we would have to um, close down each intersection, which required the sheriff's department, and that was a cost for each intersection. Um, and we love our sheriff's department, and they always help us when we ask them, but it becomes really costly for a 30-minute parade. Um, and then the game, it was great. It was fun. The kids, we have a lot of football players this year. Good. It started out with little numbers, which is why there's not a JV team, and now there's tons of kids. <laughs> so lots of kids. The band was great to see. The Palm Squad was also enormous. Lots there of were kids on them. Yes, there's so, it was great. And the crowd was amazing um, for being a rainy night. And then, you know, Bachelor Pad was there with their truck and the new ice cream truck in town. Sweetie, sweetie. Mm -hmm. They were there, so it's just a really, really great community feel. And that concludes my day. Well, thank you. <laughs> Very cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, I went to the town council a couple days ago, and they, at the up there, were saying, what is this lock they're talking about? And I didn't say anything, but I knew, because I was a band booster mom, fighting flock of Falcon Fury. I wanted to just, I wanted just to let them tell this is what it's about. <laughs> but anyway, I didn't. But I kept thinking about it. <laughs> yeah, I think, book. and I think the PTO is doing a right that mm -hmm. you've been flocked. Yeah, I know. Yeah, that's, yeah, where they're putting cute. signs in people's yeah. yards. Yeah, um, it so so cute. it's their fundraiser. You can pay twenty five dollars, and the PTO will go out. There's a sign right out here that they put in someone's yard that says you've been flocked. And they sprinkle biodegradable confetti. That's a great idea. Yeah. It is biodegradable. That's a good sound yeah. point. I mean, it, it is environmentally friendly, so people don't get all like upset that they're littering. Yes, no, it will it will disintegrate and stuff. So yeah, that's that's their fundraiser that they're doing. So you can go on to the PTO website and pay twenty five dollars and flock somebody. There you go, Jill. Okay then. Um, I, I don't have any um, additional comments to make uh, beyond what everybody else has shared. Um, there's a, a lot of great things going on in the school district, and it's wonderful to see. All right, we'll move on to the FHEA update. Mr. Buckley, welcome. We love having you here.
so uh, I'm setting this up. We, um, <clears throat> the papers that I gave you are some employee comments. Um, the first one uh, are our responses. It's on the side at the bottom. There's just a little gray bottom uh, button. I get it now? Yep, you did. All right. Um, so, on our little handout there, we have your uh, so comments to. Um, oh man. Actually, I think this was it. We can type faster. There we go. All right. And then. So, not share. Slideshow. I'm a little rusty. I've done that. <laughs> um, so, uh, what you have in your hands are um, copies of uh, comments from teachers. So, I sent out a survey um, to all staff for an August update. Uh, wanted to get some snapshots uh, specifically on questions that we had on our meet and confer survey, so we could compare staff morale from January to August. Um, and so we know that it's the beginning of the new year, so there's always going to be a little bit more positive in that new year, but we also wanted to highlight, I think, that a lot of hard work um, that we've put in as a district has gone into making some very needed changes, and I thought that that would, you know, show some positive things. So there's that. Um, so what I've got is a, a little PowerPoint here, and it's going to give us some snapshot on the numbers, and then we'll kind of discuss uh, the comments the teachers had based on those. Uh, so the first thing that I wanted to do was, first question was, uh, what is your overall opinion of FHUSD professional development so far this school year? Uh, we had a positive response from 72% of teachers 15% were neutral and then negative 13%. In contrast to January, we only had a 21% positive rating, 25% uh, neutral, and 54% negative. So that was one of the reasons that we formed that uh, professional development committee at the district level um, and really revamped in service. Yes. When in August did you give it, when did you give it to everyone? This was sent out after, was sent out Friday of the first week of school. Okay, so they would have had it like a couple weeks before. Or yeah. A week before. Yeah, okay. so the week before it would have. Okay. And, and I really wanted to make sure there because, you know, I think you we spent a lot of time in, in service and then the kids come in. And so sometimes you get like a, a, a change of like, oh, I thought I was good, but I guess I'm not because now the kids are here and I don't know what I'm doing. Um, and we didn't see that reflected in the survey, so that was that was good. That was a positive thing for us. Um, the other things that we had, I feel valued and respected as a professional by site administration. We are at an 87% positive rating there, only 11% neutral, and negatives all the way down at 2%, yes. um, which was wonderful. And uh, full disclosure that this was completely anonymous. There was no trace back to the emails whatsoever. The only identifying um, factors that we gave were how long you have been an educator, how long you've been with the district, and then how long, um, where you work. You know? And so um, adding this year, I actually separated first year teachers out from the one to five group so that we could specifically hone in on how we're doing for our brand new teachers. So, so that's an highlight like this year. Are those percentages all teachers or just the, the um, teachers who have been here more than one year? The, this is everyone. Okay. All together. And we included classified in this as well. I'm correct me if I'm wrong. We included classified because one of the uh, initiatives that FHEA is really working on is representing all employees, not just certified. Um, so when it comes to a meet and confer, we would prefer to have a meet and confer where it's everyone together. We just feel like that would be better for everyone. And as far as like for Dr. Jagodinsky, it's yeah. not a matter of having to go back and forth between two different meetings um, and you know satisfying two groups. If everybody can have one voice, then we can get all everything cleared out from there. 
Um, and then in comparison to where we were in January, only 60% felt uh, valued and respected by their site administration, with a negative of 15%. So I um, was really happy to see some of the changes there. Um, however, our next slide is going to show the biggest change um, in our surveys. So we had 87% feeling positive, uh, feeling valued and respected by district administration, as opposed to 42% in January. So obviously a big positive thing for us to be pretty happy about there. I am um, super happy to see that. I just want to cautiously say that they're not, they're not the same people. So yeah, the people right. in January with our turnover are not necessarily the same people answering in August. So I'm really curious to make sure that that, I'm super happy about that. Right. I just don't, I want to just take this cautiously and not get into the, the politics of what that might mean because I think there's a lot of confounding factors there. Super happy and I hope that those numbers and I anticipate that those numbers Will be the same in January of 2023. Right, and one thing that I think um, we're so one thing we're going to try to do is do a, a quarter survey, just like this check-in. So we'll do another one at the in October, another one in December, another one in March, and then the idea is that we'll be able to see year like month to month, because obviously even just like comparing third quarter in general to first quarter, like. I shave all of August and in January after that scruff, I'm feeling a little tired, you know. So, you know, it'll be nice to have that uh, a little bit better data tracking there. Uh, and then um, choosing personal uh, personal level of morale or job satisfaction. So our job satisfaction rating is 83% positive currently. Uh, and then January it was down to 51. So like I said, there's definitely, we want to acknowledge that, you know, that doesn't, that's not a, a perfect side-by-side um, -side view. I will say, and one thing that was nice, being on Meet and Confer for two years straight, um, a frustration that I had my first year with Meet and Confer with our survey, we only had 32 respondents. Uh, we then were up at 53 in January, and this year we're about 47. So this survey is about 47, so it is pretty comparable. We're keeping that high number up. Uh, and that was one thing that I noticed because as I read the comments uh, that teachers had, some people were talking about feeling like they were ignored. And I feel like the easiest way to see, feel if somebody's ignored or see that is them not even responding to the survey. So I think it's good that our survey, you know, we're starting to find that number that we'll get back. Um, so that's, that's a positive. And then um, school level of morale or job satisfaction. Uh, January we had 53%, August we had 64%. Um, so that number did drop. It was the survey was out for about a week. That number did drop with later respondents, which makes sense. Um, just knowing workplace as you start to kind of talk to some of your coworkers, you know, day three, day four, you're feeling pretty good. Once you get that first little bump, response might change a little bit. So um, that is, so that's it for the numbers. Um, those I wanted to make sure we highlighted. Um, the professional development responses were pretty high. Uh, those, were, those were nice. A lot of people would like more options. And I will say from like a professional development committee member, because uh, you know, Chris Alexander and I were pretty hard on this, um, we were limited on our, who like, we were limited to our options based on who we could have, like based on who presented. So we're looking forward to having more presenters next year. Uh, we just didn't have as many presenters um, as ideally we would like. Um, but that's something that we can work on. It gives us a lot of stuff to work on. Uh, biggest concern I've seen with professional development that I think as a district we can kind of work on is the continuing education certification hours. We have a lot of people whose certifications are going to come up soon, and that is an area that we've been lacking in the last few years. So if they've just attended our professional development opportunities, we have a lot of teachers that may fall a little short there. So that's just something systemically that I think, now that we see they've kind of highlighted this as an issue, I think that's something that we'll be able to go 
Well, and I, I like that one of the uh, respondents said that they would like a survey asking what teachers would like to see as professional development. A lot of people had talked about, um, you know, power schools and, and different programs that we use. So, you know, maybe that would be an option too. And even if there's smaller professional developments that can happen during the year so that it's a continue, continuation, it's not just all crammed in at the first week. So. Yeah, so I thought that was a lot of feedback. Great. Did you share this with, because um, some of these are logistical, like my ID badge is wrong. Right. Um, right. So <laughs> were these shared, or did you ask people, like send out follow-up, like, hey, if you need to fix your ID badge, or? Um, I, we did, as, as a lot of those were a little bit earlier, mm -hmm. okay. so there have been a lot more responses. So for example, like IT, you'll see a lot of IT stuff in here. Yeah. Um, but the district's done, the district administration's done a lot of work on that in the last week mm -hmm. that I do think will start to, to fix these. And Dr. Jagodzinski and I did have, we have a monthly meeting um, on Mondays. So two Mondays ago, he and I sat down with the data that I've had so far mm -hmm. so that we could share that so that he could get kind of a jump start on our goals. And has done a wonderful job doing that. Yeah, yeah, just for, you know, just to let people know that they're being heard, but you can't ask for a raise and then not and then <laughs> a survey, you know, like, so probably more confidential. So just like it's not that we're not listening to people, but right. you know, some of these comments are so it's specific to yeah. their to HR yeah. that it would be nice to be able just to be able to say, here are some resources if you are still you know. And I'm not saying it's not necessarily your job, but at least tell people to call Krista. Yeah, just because, um, like, I don't want people to think we're ignoring very specific comments, but there's nothing we can do about it. When you don't know who it is. Right? Yeah. yeah. So, Absolutely. Um, and I want them to feel heard and validated and that what they put in here is and And I appreciate that you shared that, you know, unless you did some detective work and it was like, okay, <laughs> you've been at, you're at this school, you said you've been there this long, you know, um, it would take some time to figure out who they were because one of the comments was, I know these surveys aren't confidential. Uh, we didn't get any names. We don't know who the responses came from. <laughs> um, and one thing that I have um, spread specifically with like our, you know, I, I try to tell our members, but then also like any of the teachers, um, is with Kaylee Brown in HR. She has been 100% responding. Um, I know I've had, I had some different things with certification and things to work with, and she has been responding usually in less than an hour. So she's putting in a lot of hard work, um, and she was left a very difficult, in a very difficult position. And so we're trying to make sure we tell the employees, you know, hey, she's gonna be as responsive as she can. She also has a lot of things that she needs to work on. Um, and so, but we appreciate her. Because that's another thing is a lot of times I think we do these things. I think it actually showed up in the survey because district office was actually included. Mm -hmm. The district office employees were included in the survey. And one thing that came up for them that's a frustration is that they took over these positions and most of the district office is new. Right. And there's a little bit of grace that needs to be gone out for everybody. Yeah. So not just our like classroom teachers or classified staff, but like also the district office. Just some grace in timing. Let us work through some things. Um, so they shared that, which I thought was really important to then share out to everybody else. That you know we do have people that are trying very hard to take care of everything. They just need to be a little more patient and flexible. Well, and I'd like to address a comment on here. Um, mm -hmm. It says that teacher feedback and input is often ignored, and I just don't try anymore. That makes me really sad. First of all, yeah. um, I never want that. I never want our staff to feel that they're being ignored or you know that we're not listening. Um, as a governing board, this is the first. You know, this past year is the first time that we've actually heard from FHEA, where you've come on a regular basis and explained staff concerns, and and the board definitely takes those things to heart in in making decisions, making you know policy changes, whatever. But we also have an administrator now who is listening and changing and, and looking out for the best interest of the district. So I, I never want staff to feel that way. And, and this is a new era. So I, I want to be out with the old and I want to start hearing their concerns. And he wants to hear their concerns. So we need to put that 
we've always been ignored and nothing's going to change to the wayside. Please explain that to them. It, it, it's different now. Everybody wants to hear from them. We're happy to hear from FHEA and we're trying to make changes, all of us, in the best interest of the district. And it wasn't that we didn't want to hear from them before, but I don't think we necessarily had the alignment at the various levels for all of that to come up to us. Yeah, and I will say from like an FHEA standpoint, our membership is up 80%. Um, with new, we actually have a few applications out, so we'll be up at about probably about 90% just in so a year. So more unified. Yeah. That's that. Unified. Because <laughs> we're a unified district. Yes. And so we, like, our our membership has, has flown mm -hmm. up. Um, and, and so it's also one of those as FHA president that, you know, I, I was not in that role until last year. And I really do feel like we work very well together um, and look forward to continuing Absolutely. The, this and my thing to teachers is yeah like this this is new and you know we have had these board reports uh, salaries did increase working conditions across the board um, policy changes were made based on surveys and teachers input you know even the with the professional development committee we use the meet and confer survey to kind of enlighten a lot of those um, so. Yeah, I mean, we. I think we are starting to feel, I think people are feeling more heard. I think things are getting there. Um, I just think it's a matter of, yeah, communicating out and all being on the same page. So what would be some of the things that I'm, and I obviously am <laughs> just looking at this now for the first time, but some of the things um, are like, I would like to know what will happen with this or this. What are the best ways to communicate with, um, with you know, staff, faculty, that because some of the things we do discuss in board meetings, and I don't expect teachers to come to every one of our board meetings, and the minutes don't always capture everything, but so what are the ways that would be most helpful for us to, to let teachers and staff know what's happening around some of the issues that they have concerns about? I think if we could do some sort of like, and, and I don't know, I'm thinking of like some big things, um, like a newsletter update on where we are on consolidation, even though I know there's a lot to work there, there's a lot of questions left, mm -hmm. you know, that we don't have the answers to. Mm -hmm. But if that's communicated, because I did notice there was a lot of people, you know, I do work at the middle school, and so there's a lot of people at the middle school that were like, oh, and I even heard today, you know, oh, we're all moving, you know, there's, it's, it was like, oh, wait a minute, we, I know those things, but I don't know what other people don't know. And so I think we all kind of fall into that of like, oh, yeah, we know, we talked about it. It's on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's, that's what I'm saying. I don't expect them to come to every board meeting, but, you know, I also don't want them to feel like they're kept in the dark. Well, and as for the consolidation that's mentioned in here, um, the board hasn't the voted, voted on that. Yeah. So there's no, th that's the reason that there's no information out there other than what the facility committee has decided and, and presented. Re recommended, yes. But Yeah, recommended that the board hasn't voted on that. So we can't share information that doesn't exist at this time. So. Okay. Yeah. And so uh, there was, yeah, that was a big concern, or I don't know if concern, I would more so label that question. Yeah, yeah sure. And then concern. Um, yeah, a lot of it was consolidation, and then as far as there was um, a want for more communication on if we pass the override, what that then looks like for um, for, the, for the teachers, for the classified staff. Um, that was one big, they were like, well, what does this mean for us? Uh, we did have a discussion, because I know we have some AC issues, mm -hmm. and uh, one of our classrooms, that, we have a few classrooms that don't have AC over at the middle school, uh, but one that we plan on using uh, doesn't have any AC, and one thing that got out there was uh, some people were informed that, well, until the override passes, the AC can't like we ran out of money. And I was like, I I don't think that's how that works. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think that's how that works. It definitely doesn't work that way. Rumors. Yeah, like, right. always, there's always one that'll stump you. Did they? But I would be interested. So if they heard AC's not going to get fixed, honestly, like to me, I'm interested in who did they talk to, who did they go to, like what was the chain? Because there was a breakdown in that. So how do we fix that? Like you 
you put in a ticket and you do this and you copy in the principal or whatever that process is, there's obviously some miscommunication at some point because obviously that is a health issue. I'm sure that we will fix that air conditioning, yeah, Dr. Would, J. Kids um, well, we, we, uh, I mean, we, we've already exhausted Bel Air almost exclusively in the first month. So there have been issues. I know John's been on top of it. Um, but I think we can assist with that. You know, once um, you know, once we have, you know, some more, we're still finalizing some information on like override and bond, and we can get that out. We have an infographic we just got that is um, final approval by uh, the attorneys and Stiefel. Once that is is complete, we can start getting that out to the community and to our staff of where that money is going. Um, but yeah, we we definitely have some. It's hot this time of year, and I can say that, not to make an excuse, but a lot of school districts, we run into AC problems in August, uh, and then it starts to get a little bit better. But we are, I know Bel Air's been at, at our facility somewhere almost daily working on them, and this is um, one of the things that needs to be addressed uh, at some point is the air conditioning at the middle school because it is 22 years old. And I will say for our clarification wow. that there is no class in there. We yeah. did move them out. Yeah, sure. Okay. So I don't want anybody watching YouTube to be like, oh, my kid doesn't have AC in their classroom. Every working classroom. <laughs> every every kid is in a classroom yes. with air conditioning and teacher. Okay. And we have three team rooms that are also available. We have so. backups. Yes. Excellent. That's, that's good to know, and I thank you for clarifying. Yes. yes. <laughs> um, any other questions? We appreciate yeah. everything you do to put this together. And yeah, thank you for all of this. It's very good. I think it's important that this gets conveyed, and and I, I do really appreciate the relationship uh, between the board and, and the district that you brought to you know to each meeting. Now that we're starting to hear more, so. Awesome. And yeah, there are more things on there that I didn't bring up at all yeah. because I I go with the public comment rule of if it's specific to an individual or you know like hr issues yes that i don't i don't mention those because i don't want to. yeah it's good to stay good. away from those things right like public meetings yeah definitely <laughs> so all right thank, thank you, you so much thank you so much would it be uh, possible and this is great it just makes me think about another group that we'd like to hear from the, from the parents the best representation of parents pto would be interesting to have somebody from the PTO here to kind of give us the same kind of information, their feedback. I don't, I don't know what it is. To be We've with you, discussed looking at having, you know, we we tried a little bit this past school year, like we had Golden Eagle come and give us an update, and I think we did have one other group come and give us an update, and then... Yeah, we had we a did, list of groups. We had a list of groups, and we need to, to actually get that... Uh, happening uh, probably like PTO, Golden Eagle, the Coalition, um, maybe Kiwanis, like any of the ones that come on campus and do um, activities with our students that are actually a, a kind of exterior civic organization in right. addition to, you know, PTO, um, which is more like they're separate, but they're us. They're separate. <laughs> um, on like a rotation, right, which might mean that they come two or three times a year at most, but that's probably enough, I think. You know, we definitely have um, FHEA -E come um, to all the work study sessions, and I don't know, I, I, I want them to come that frequently. I don't know that we would have anything significant from those other groups, like sure. once a month, but I think if we could get them in, like I said, on rotation, at least hear from them twice a year, that would be really great because they are representing different constituents in our community, um, both from a, you know, parent or just community member perspective as well as what they do for our students. Well, and and I agree, um, you know, we should hear, I, I want to hear their updates and what they're doing, but with PTO, something like this, you know, that Mr. Buckley presented, um, you know, obviously PTO can't stand up there and go, well, we've heard this and we've heard this because first of all, it's just all hearsay, but second, um, you know, it would be nice if they put together a document like this, you know, concerns that we've heard from parents, you know, people ask, like, 
why do kids leave our district? Well, I can give you I can give you 20 reasons why kids leave our district. You know, so you know, people ask me that all the time when I was part of PGO, and it was like, well, because of this, this, and this. And so it would be nice if they could compile something periodically, and it's like, you know, here's what what PTO, what people are bringing to PTO. And from the parent standpoint, just like Mr. Buckley did, from the teacher standpoint yeah. or from the staff standpoint. I, I would just caution to make sure that it's data. Yes. So because well, that's I why I think our if they just gave it. Yeah, our anecdotes, yeah. anecdotes get really tricky because you often hear, oh, I've heard it from everyone. Right. Yeah. That well, just that's... happens to be your two friends who are very animated about it. Does it not? I think that. Anyone? But I would love to hear, like, okay, we give teachers two hundred dollars a year. What are the main things that they're asking for? Right. You know, things like that that can be quantified that we could do something as a board. I agree. Um, and remembering that they're volunteers that work their tails off, so making sure that it's yeah. convenient. It's Joe well knows they work their tails off, right. and make sure it's convenient for them. Well, that's why I just think a document of just you know, we've we've talked forever. Perception is reality. If we don't know what the perception is, we can't deal with it. So. You know, I don't think that they need to stand up in a public meeting and list it all, but just like this, you know, every teacher has their own perspective and it's based on their own experience, just like parents. But for something like this, this was a survey and right. we need to get better at um, regular surveys of our students and our parents so that they can be anonymous, so that we can get the feedback in a, you know, regular cadence so that we can look at trends and see are we trending up are we trending down is it across the board is it in certain areas so that we can take actionable steps to make improvements and things and did we say we're going to do one after the first quarter that we were going to let everybody get through the first quarter so. and then send out a survey that we were going to try and do it like three times or something or twice this year yeah and there's ways to set up surveys so that you can make sure that you can use an anonymous link but then you can create it so that you can only so many responses can come from an IP address. Yeah. And I'm always amazed sometimes I get surveys from things. I'm like, I go on it 12 times and they look at me as 12 different people and I'm not 12 different people. <laughs> there is a way to set it up so that at some point, like when you're in it the second time, it won't actually record your response. Um, well, so many times. So, but then also making sure that the response rate is, is right. you know, appropriate because a lot of times, sorry, don't mean to put on the, my professor hat, but it's people who are angry and the people who are yeah, happy. Right. And you sort of miss that, the, the in-between. So making sure that we that we hear from everyone as much as we can because, um, you know, it is. I think right. perception is reality in a lot of different ways. Well, and I'd like to, you know, have a better, more layman term questions this year as opposed to the ones that we used last year that, People like people read them and they're like, I don't even know what that means. So I, I would like clear, concise questions that, you know, and some of them can be open ended to get some comments. But um, yeah, I would just like to see things that are a little bit basic. Yeah. So I actually have a couple parent surveys that we've given out to big school districts that shall not be named, um, and uh, that I think would be helpful. Yeah. Great. Well, getting ahead of the agenda a little bit here for asking the question, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we, we had trouble with our parent survey last year. Yes. And uh, I think that when it comes to policy and goals and objectives and so forth, we want to have the data that we can rely on to show where we're going with that stuff. And so having this is great because this is half the battle, right? The other half are our parents and our families. Yes. And I think it would be great if we're going to put together some objectives that we want to measure performance on that we have something similar to this. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and we know that it takes time to develop um, uh, kind of a process so that everybody knows every three months you're going to get another survey. We're trying to track what's happened since the last one and what yes. things, where your mind is at. But I really uh, miss parent side of it right now. Yeah, and I agree. Okay, um, public comments, do we have any tonight, Krista? No. Okay, so then we can move on to our information discussion items, the first of which is board goals, including objectives and measurements. So 
As all board members know, when we met here um, previously for our work study session, we looked, we, we didn't really look at our goals. We were focused, we're talking about strengths, um, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Um, we kind of ran out of time in that meeting, so that's why we have it on another agenda meeting here, um, or agenda for a meeting here, to uh, revisit the governing board goals. Um, just a reminder, the governing board goals is something that we normally adopt. Obviously, this is not a business meeting. So tonight, if we do decide to wordsmith or make changes or deletions, whatever, to the board goals, um, then those would be up for adoption in an upcoming business meeting. If we don't make any changes to the board goals, um, we would still probably want to at least adopt them as the, because they're stated here as 21, 22, right. and we would mm -hmm. adopt them as 22, 23. Um, in addition to the board goals and making any uh, changes to those, as Dana mentioned, um, I think one of the more important things for us to do this evening is really talk about objectives associated with those goals because that will help set some clear expectations for Dr. J about what we feel are the targets that we want him to go after in support of the overarching goals, which then he can then disseminate out to the rest of his team and say, you know, the board has set X objectives with X criteria for measurement, and now this is how we're going to break that up and make it happen this school year. So with that said, let's look at the governing board goals from last year and discuss whether there's anything that we feel needs to be changed. And I'll just go ahead and read the 2021-2022 board goals. The first is champion a unified learning environment that engages students, their families, and our community. Support, and support individualized and equitable opportunities for all students to reach their maximum potential. Provide a safe and secure environment for students, staff, and visitors that supports physical and mental well-being. Consistently maintain responsible stewardship of district funds and resources in the best interests of our students and community. And then the last one is promote and advance the district's success and excellence. I think these goals are very good. Is there anything, do we feel like there's anything missing? Like I feel, I feel across these five goals, we hit on aspects of, you know, academic achievement, kind of like the whole student perspective. We also touch on um, importance for, you know, uh, staff and visitors, whether that's, you know, physical safety or, you know, mental well-being. Um, we talk about promoting the district's success and excellence, which we discussed many times is something that um, we feel isn't, <laughs> doesn't get very well, doesn't get accomplished very well. Um, and then we also talk about, you know, fiscal responsibility, right? So I, I, I feel like we touch on all the areas um, that we need to touch on and the purpose of the goals is to be kind of broad, and then with our objectives, we get very tight and focused. Without me telling you what to do, what to do right. or how to do or it. To do. <laughs> that, that's the fine line. Yes, the fine line. It, the board essentially <laughs> has limited a power, yes. a limited ability, limited working, you know. Um, so that's that's where like it becomes a really gray area because if we we can set objectives but as a board we don't personally go out and do anything yeah. ours is all through policy and procedures so that's that's my kind of my issue with setting objectives is we have to be really careful on that you know that there's with with different things going on you know people want the board to go sit in classrooms and monitor teachers. Well, we don't do that. That's our job is not to manage staff. It's not to micromanage, you know, our superintendent. It's to set policies and procedures and goals for our superintendent to decide how those are going to get implemented to accomplish them. Jill, would it be better, I think, that if we said change the wording a little bit? Mm -hmm. What are our expectations? Our expectations, our expectations and that's, are that our achievements on standardized tests increase 10% every year. 
right. that our student growth in math increases 10% every year. That all of our schools will increase a letter grade every year. So those are our expectations, but that those are also their objectives. Yeah, but, right. we, but we don't have the ability to do saying, those things. So. I mean, I can tell you how to increase our achievement. And that is, <laughs> but you can't teach. personally do it. That so is that's reach. a thing. Right. So I mean, it is a super right. easy way to do it. We know for a yeah. fact, based on data, that um, formative assessments and reteach will increase standardized test scores. We know that for a fact. And potentially giving kids um, extra credit for getting a good standardized test score also 100% increases kids' motivation to do well on those. We know that because there's a principal that, that did a really good job of instituting those things in our district. <laughs> um, so I think that we say we want these to increase, and then Dr. J says, and y'all are going to do that because reteach is not optional anymore. Right. Mm -hmm. Kids are doing it. Our Saturday sessions, not optional anymore. Our catch-up room, not optional anymore. These are things, these are the expectations that I have for each principal to do those things. So he's delegating based on our expectations. Right. Well, the key word is that he's doing it. Yes. 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 Right, exactly. Because we can say what we want. He has to decide how he's going to do it. That's right. not our job. So, yeah. and so, if we, and they have to be realistic. You want to do the whole smart thing? Go ahead, Dana. No, uh, <laughs> when we've done this in, in my career forever, but it's kind of his job to take our goals that we have and put together those measurable objectives that, quite frankly, we don't know what they are. Specific, we have ideas. measurable, achievable, realistic, within a time frame. But yeah. he knows more about that than we will Correct. Know. Yeah, so we give him ideas about, like, we expect academic standards to increase. Yeah. Blah, 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 I mean, that's blah. all we have to say. Yep. Yeah. The 10% I wouldn't go with. No. Because, uh, no as, I, I, as, I, as sorry, as that's as my, if, right. we had yeah. a, if we had a uh, federal grant, then yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but our expectations are that there is an increase every single year. Yeah. Right. And, I, and, and he is or will be, as, as with time, more familiar with what our potential is. And even more so than we might when it comes to some of the details behind our goals. I don't think anybody argues about our goals. I think mean, every, every school district I've ever known has the same goals and different wording. But I, I, I do think that it's uh, Dr. J's um, job to actually dig down into those goals with some measurable objectives. Does that make sense? It does, and, and they align with what I have. Like, I, I've thought about a lot of this and um, with our strategic plan that we're going to be putting together. Uh, you know, for me, you know, it's really about the academic excellence. It's about um, students having a memorable experience through athletics and clubs and extracurricular, about school safety about having a positive climate on campus and, and you know, caring about kids uh, and doing it within the framework that we have available to us. So um, I think what I walked into with plans of how I think we get there is, is lines up with, with those goals. So, yeah. You know, and I don't know how I feel about to do this, right? So we don't go into that discussion. Right. <laughs> but even the whole concept of the strategic plan <clears throat> is not necessarily a board function. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's how we get to where the goals mm -hmm. that the board has set. And yeah, it's just part of the process. And and based on what we've been discussing already, you know, feedback and and having a voice and hearing from our staff, that that's the point of this. So I when I shared out, um, you know, our strategic plan this earlier today, I, I sent out, okay, we're ready to move forward now. I need people to join this. But if you don't have the time to join it, you'll you'll have a lot of survey opportunities to still have a voice and still get get it across. So what I want to hear is what what do, what does each stakeholder group feel is is the needs of the district? So we do this with the staff a little bit easier. Um, one way is you know the surveys. Another way is um, I've recently uh, planned out uh, three days to. 
um, go visit with, just be available at a site all day. So I'm going to work at a site all day and just, you know, on your prep or before after school, you can come talk to me and share with me what, you know, what's going on or what you might need questions with or, or things of that nature. What do we need? Where do we need to go? And then the parents were doing that a lot through the coffee sessions. Like we already have a pretty, you know, strong focus group of close to 20 people who come regularly. And, and through those conversations, they provide that feedback. And that can be more specific as we continue going. And then we will open it up to parents to be on that committee and students to be on that through the Student Advisory Board, which we are now have our first meeting coming up soon. But that, those, like I said, those students have been selected and um, I think they're excited to be a part of that. So we hit all those things. And then the last part is the community piece and through the organizations I'm working with, with the Chamber and Kiwanis and Rotary, um, I'm getting their feedback as well. So, so the idea is to take all those, those voices and to pick you know, um, a few things that we just really need to hit hard. And I've, I've talked to other superintendents about this process and some believe you don't put a deadline on it, some believe you do. Um, I like the deadline just because it gives me a more of a, a feeling of there's, um, you know, there's just a need to get things done. And if there's no deadline, I feel like it can be lost with all the other things that come up. So, so I'm looking at the, a three-year plan of where do we want to be in three years as far as academic excellence? Um, where do we want to be in three years with, with athletics and clubs? And where do we want to be? in three years with the way kids feel about our district. And then hopefully um, through all that process that people will look at our district and say, one, this is, this is a great place to go to school because they have a lot of perks and advantages that, that, that other schools don't have. And as a parent, um, I feel like there, there's a strong you know, commitment to these things that are important to me. Uh, and, and we'll have hopefully some data to show uh, of the growth that we have each year that will grow that. And uh, for students, again, I think they, especially the secondary students, um, they really thrive on having a voice and having um, an opinion and, and sharing what, what they think could be better. And when you do that, I think all those things together will, will take us where we want to be. So I think we're in alignment. And we've got two governmental parties that are in our partners, you know, preservation and town government. Yes, so we, we have um, represented on student advisory board. We, we made sure of that. Mm -hmm. well, I, I, you know, I, it's easy to go down and say, you know, I would like you to do this and this and this and this. That's not our job. Yeah. It's not. And, and we don't want to do his job. So we're not pushing things off on the super dad, but that's why we hired him. So. Right. Well, and how we think he should do things may, you know, he has a better idea of how he should get things done. So and there's five of us that may not agree on anything. Exactly. And five of us can't go out and work individually and call it a board. <laughs> well, I can, I can share to give you some peace of mind that whatever the goals that I present to you will have, you know, there, there will be, you know, we, we want to definitely set our, our, our goals high, you know, like high expectations is our theme this year. Yes. So, so our goals should reflect that. And then based off that, the principal's goals will reflect mine and, and so far down. But um, yeah, I, I definitely think there's, there's immediate needs that, that we need to address. And I just, I just had this conversation earlier today. You know, when you look at the, the state testing, it's, it's been a rough road um, because the test has been changed three times in three years. And so it's, that's, that's, that, that's not an excuse, it's just you, you're given a set of rules and a playbook and then you prepare for it and it changes on you. And so, so that, that is one thing that we'll hopefully see some consistency now moving forward for the first time in a long time. We'll have some benchmark data to use mm -hmm. uh, from the ACT last year to, to this upcoming year. Yeah. Because um, my understanding in the past is Fountain Hill students did not all take the ACT. That was the first time that they've all done that. So now you have some, some strong actual data to use. For the uh, younger students, the new state test, it'll be year two. So again, we can, we can, we can look at that. Um, I've also been in contact with, um, with Vail on our benchmark system, because I think that is something that also needs to be repaired a little bit. So I am working with, with them on getting those back up and running, because I, 
I use the benchmarks a lot. Um, on benchmark day, I would actually sit and watch the results come in, and you could just kind of see, and it, it was either like joyous or it was like, yeah, we gotta get back to work, you know? So, but the more data we have, uh, the better we can, we, can, we can show the growth that we have. And I think we can set that up uh, for some of these, like in the safety regards, uh, by the moves we made. Um, some of that is through action. Uh, like for example, the new security at every every school. That's a new a new initiative. Um, you know, if we can update our cameras, that's another actionable thing that we can show. But I think we can also hopefully show that um, major behaviors are down, and and fights and assaults and threats and things like that are down. So so you can we can hopefully show um, over time that that those those uh, efforts are are showing some kind of. And assessments are on different levels. I mean, you're talking about our state levels and national levels. The classroom is, is no different. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in, in my past position, um, we were required to show that our uh, assessments in our classroom improved throughout the course of the year. Um, and it's different for every classroom, but that was what the superintendent was asking us to do. So yeah. those are kind of things that we know are out there. Uh, but they're measurable, and this today was great. I mean, this this is a great measure of, of what we've tried to accomplish in the last year. So, uh, doing the same thing with uh, testing and doing the same thing with community surveys and all, all those things are, are ways that we can monitor, uh, we can uh, track our goals right. in terms of where we want to be. I think uh, Nadia used the term target. And that's really a good word. I mean, what is our target? It, it's it's to improve student achievement, obviously. But okay, so what's the measure and the apparatus behind that? And I think you've got a good handle on that. Well, in in our teacher evaluation system, their their goals, unless it's changed, which I don't think it has, uh, there are there is a uh, academic goal. And then there's a performance goal that goes with their with their evaluation. So, the performance for um, a lot of teachers was the AZ merit um, if they if their class fell under that. But if I were in a PE class, I still have this is my beginning of the year, and then this is where the kids ended up, and there should be there should be growth there. And so we help as site leaders guide the, the teachers on a realistic attainable goal, and then. Each year, you try to you know challenge yourself more and more. So that that's in place, and we will just continue to use that uh, data to to help um, get an overall picture of the site. Will the state be um, giving out letter grades this year? Yes. And do we know when those will be released? Uh, typically, they were always in like October. October. Yeah. So, but again, I would. And you know, from my you know from working with you in the past mm -hmm. that. I presented to you a lot of data over the years. Like I, I really dive into that. Um, I, I think I, I just think it's been this time around. I think it is going to be um, a little skewed just because of the changes of tests. Sure. Um, I can tell you, I was in you know the the most minute details of how to prepare for state tests and all the benchmarks and all of the the beyond textbooks, assessments, and all the stuff we did, and and the ACT is just so much different. You know, it, it, it's, it, yes, you should still know how to do math and social studies and read a passage and be able to answer it, but there are things that, that you can do to prepare for that, or there wouldn't be ACT prep books yes. and classes and things of that nature. So, so I, I do think it is one of those things where, um, we have to we have to have a full cycle of data to really get a feel for where we're at. No, and I agree with you. And, and then it's fine tuning it because when we've had growth, you know, again, it was it, a lot of the, that growth. It was the same teachers, the same students, the same everything. Everything's the same. Yeah. But we did some things to to change things, like the reteach or you know extra interventions or just focusing on those power standards even more and more and more. And the math teachers got really good at that. They understood that. So um, so I would I would just I would give it another year on the letter grade to really get a feel for where we're at because we also are coming out of 
a very tough two years of the pandemic and virtual and um, and, and things of that nature. So, um, but at least we'll know our starting point. We will you know, know our starting I mean, point. Absolutely. Over the past couple of years, you know, data has all been skewed. Not every kid took it. I mean, there, yep. you know, there's been a lot going on, but it, at least by them releasing the scores, yes. releasing the letter grade, we have a starting point because yep. otherwise, like right now, we're kind of walking blind. We don't really know where our kids fell. We don't know, you know, if our teachers did well, did they prepare them? Did they not prepare them? Did the kids take it seriously? Did they not? We don't know. So, uh, you know, I look forward to that data uh, once it's released because at least then we're like, okay, if we're low, we've got work to do. And if we came in, you know, average, okay, we have, there's room for improvement, you know, I mean, but to just be like, oh, hey, we need to improve those scores. Well, we probably do, but we don't know. So. Well, it's, and that's the hardest part of the last two years being a site leader is that, you know, in the 2020 21 school year, they moved to AZM2 and no one really knew what that was. Right. So you're using AZ Merit data, which was nine, 10, and 11, six different tests. And, and then all of a sudden now it's sophomores. Right. And my big argument there was if I have a sophomore in calculus, which we do mm -hmm. have that from time to time, they not only did they, they pass algebra probably in seventh or eighth grade and pass the AZ Merit, but then they also did geometry in ninth, eighth or ninth grade. So now we're having them you know, pause their calculus learning to go back and take a test on something they've already passed yeah. and showed a four, which is the highest score. And, and I just felt like they should have got a pass and, and not interrupted that mm -hmm. for those students. That didn't happen. So then you get this easy M2 data, which is now different. And then you're like, okay, now I have this set of data. Okay, let's get after it. But now we're switching to ACT. Mm -hmm. So now you, you, you again, and again, these are these are just, they're not excuses. I don't make excuses. These are just the, the reality the of it. It is. Yeah. And so it's it's like you're when you when you have a set of rules to play by and those rules change, it does take a little time to to reorganize. And, and maybe the ACT hits a little harder on some different things that we need to prepare for. Again, you know, we should be able to, our students should be able to pass any math test that they're, they're asked to take because they spent a year in math and they should be able to do it. But sometimes, you know, knowing a little bit more about what the expectation is can, can help you prepare for that. Or the other side of it is, is when you see that data come in. So we have that benchmark data now from the ACT. Um, again, the hard part we're going to run into here is that the kids who struggled with it there is no test for them now this right. year. Yeah. They're done. So, so the, best, the best shot we have is the ACT Aspire, which is the ninth grade test. Take that and data the, as the yeah. benchmark, build upon that in the sophomore year, put in our own benchmarks in place to see where they're at, and then prepare, prepare, prepare for that junior year test. Mm -hmm. But that, again, is, is really a three-year time period. Right. Yeah. And when we had growth in, in the past, when those ninth graders took that first easy merit, they, the scores were not where they wanted where right. they want to be. But by their junior year, sophomore year, junior year, they they had growth because we could track in a small district every single kid, and we did that. And well, and then to piggyback off of what Dana said, then you know, because standardized testing keeps changing and the state keeps changing, and obviously we have to go off of those scores. That's where our letter grade is going to come from. But with the classroom assessment you know, that maybe that that's something that we look at as yes. opposed to, you know, just always waiting on the state the state assessments that, you know, individual teacher goals, like yes. you said, would then relate to the principal goals, to your goals, and so on. But, you know, more individualized assessments as opposed to just always banking on the state. And, and, the, the, and the beyond textbook, the veil assessments are, are very well aligned. And, and I felt very strongly that if our kids were doing well on those benchmarks, that it was going to translate, and it did. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, that's a goal right now is to, I've been in contact with Brent Edwards down there about you know, getting, uh, making sure we have all that in line and ready to go. And they've assured me that they have made the changes that, that they feel are needed to prepare for the ACT. So there are some, some bigger questions we could do, we could look at. Um, you know, Saturday ACT prep for our juniors leading up to that test, uh, for our eighth graders and, you know, our lower level classes, you know, using um, the uh, 
uh, academic strategies to prepare. I'm a big fan of for the ACT of every day in class, do an ACT question in the first five minutes of the class. If you do that every single day, you get used to the language, you get used to the style of the test, and then it's a, it's a real simple thing. Somebody share their answer, and then somebody else share why that's right, okay? And then you, you've now started a conversation about it. So um, that is something that, again, I think we can do throughout the year to prepare for the test. That's great, and it can encompass, I mean, there's so, you know, with the ACT, you know, you've got your reading, your math, and writing. Um, that no matter what class you're in, mm -hmm. there's something that pertains to that. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. you know, social studies can be doing a writing thing, you know, math mm -hmm. does their math problems, you know, English picks up on, on you know, an English topic. Right. You know, yeah. yeah, there's all kinds of, you know, of cross-training there. And so it, <clears throat> it probably will make our kids better communicators and better writers. Mm -hmm. so. Yep. You know, and also in probably coming through CTE, it, we're required to go out and take a look at our graduates mm -hmm. and see if their current status three years hence meets the goals that they established while they were still under our control. Um, and that's gotten a lot better, uh, but it's, it's taken a lot of effort uh, to make sure that we can communicate with somebody three years after graduation. But let's face it, that's what success is. In our, it, it, if they can move on from our uh, world here in Palm Hills to whatever their goals were and be successful, that means that we've been successful. Mm -hmm. We actually, that data is available at the state and Fountain Hills is always in the yeah, top percentage of kids it, the going to, or something like that. Or, oh wait, yeah, going to college or technical right. school but, and graduating And graduating, time, right. Which, I mean, that's huge. Mm -hmm. Being able to graduate within a five year time frame. Yeah. Is college. that what on time is now, five years? Five years. <laughs> Just, just wondering what, in our board packet, we actually have individual board goals. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's quite a few individual board uh, board goals there. Yeah, we yep. did those last year. Yeah. yeah. On the CT, though, the other thing that we is is important at the high school letter grade level is the participation in you know either an advanced placement, the EVIT program. But when you do that CCRI, and, and it is a very, very challenging document to go through, and it takes hours and hours of time, um, but the seniors get points for each thing that they, they, they've done. And, you know, with, with um, that's why I'm, I'm, one of the other things I'm going to push hard on is the EBIT, um, you know, enrollment because the more kids that are completers that is a huge it's it's a benefit for them it's yeah. a benefit for everyone but it also does affect you know the school's letter grade that they have either done ap um, i was always frustrated that IV got points but ap capstone does not yeah. but you know um, but that's i guess falls under the ap piece but the more our our seniors are um, college ready and that's what some of these websites now use um, to, to determine the score is how many kids are enrolled in those types of classes and concurrent enrollment like you and I have discussed in the past. So, um, so that, that, that is concerning a little bit to me because um, I think our, our EBIT numbers have dropped over the last probably five to seven years. Um, I know like this over time. Yeah. they have. And, and when we had a, a campus here, obviously they were up a little bit. And when we had satellite programs, here they were up a little bit with with Carla and some of the people that were here for a long time. So, so we just need to get, I think, more understanding of really how great those programs are, and, and that starts with us taking, you know, students down there and attending the expos and attending tours down there, um, for to try to raise that up. I would agree with you. Just having just being the parent of two college, you know, two high school graduates here. Um, you know, it wasn't for my daughter, but we never really got a lot of information about it. And then with my son, it was frustrating because, again, didn't really get the information. And there's a lot of things that he could have done, especially because by the time he was a senior, he only needed two credits to graduate. So he, you know, he could have done a lot of different things, but we just really didn't know about it. And I always say if I don't know about it, probably a lot of people don't know about yeah. it. <laughs> well, and I think with consolidation, if that happens, 
that will open the door for more kids to participate in these programs because we were doing years ago the advanced middle school model where we were bringing kids over for math and science because there was no honor science in eighth grade. So they were taking either nature science or even biology as eighth graders. Tough class and some of them can handle it. That's right. great. So if we are on the same campus now, whether it's a teacher getting a sixth, fifth and walking over to the middle school or middle school kids walking over to the high school class, however we decide to do it, if they can knock out two or three credits prior to high school, that opens the door for, for EVIT. Because one of the hard parts with EVIT is, is that because of that, that, that block of time, you really have to take it probably at least one class online and you have to, it's usually US history is one that a lot of kids choose. Um, but I'm experiencing that now as a parent with, with, with it. Um, so I think we can prepare kids a little bit and for AP Capstone because a lot of them, you know, it's like I, I, if I have to choose that between that and AP Physics, I'd rather have AP Physics because I think it looks better on my transcript. Well, now you, you could probably do both. And if you're a band student, which um, my goal is to grow that back into what it once was, is that they were always kind of stuck as well. But if they have those extra credits, they might be able to take more of those classes. So. And I know that's a lot of high school talk right now, but that, that is a focus of, of, you know, where we're, where we're at. Um, you know, that affects the middle school because it allows those kids to now take advanced classes at a younger age instead of having to look at, well, the only way I can get these advanced classes go to basis. Well, now you can take them right here, and it's very convenient. And then, it, you know, when we move to a K-5 model, again, I have some, some ideas there with, you know, bringing – some of the, the those uh, strategies and ideas down to, to that level too. Well, you know, you know, your son got was senior year. Yeah. You know, with two credits, um, hand off. We're, bit, we're putting together at Mesa um, concurrent classes that are targeted at those students. Yeah. Because you know if you that the gap year thing, which is almost becoming the senior year in some cases, um, it just doesn't do any good to anybody. So we're trying to offer um, concurrent classes that they can attend either on one of the campuses uh, in their colleges or uh, or locally if it's got the numbers. But um, we really want to make sure that that gap year. Will well, be and that's you know Hunter Hunter wasn't an abnormality, especially for his class because his class had some rock stars. You know, your son was in there, and though you know. I think in, in their eighth grade, there were 10 or 12 of them taking geometry already. So, you know, by the time they got to high school, they were already kind of mathed out. Like, yeah. they, you know, they didn't really need hardly any more math credits. And, and by the time they were a senior, you know, COVID hit our seniors. And so Hunter opted just to do online school the whole year. He just did independent study. But e even if he hadn't, there was almost nothing left for him to take. Yeah. That he's like, I have taken, you know, I don't know how many times I can take Mr. Salzman's PE class. Like, oh, actually, you, like, you can take it every year. Well, he did. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm and just I saying, well, like, no. he did. But if it, <laughs> but there was, like, no, you know, he was like, okay, I've taken it. Yeah. I, am I going to take it three times during the day? Because I don't have anywhere else to go. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so I, I just think we need to look more at that. And then one last question about the, the test, about the letter grade. Um, do they still count points for all the people that fill out FAFSA? Yes. Yes. Yeah. See, that should not be part of a letter grade. What does FAFSA have to do with but that? It's because you have to have a FAFSA form in, if you are going to college and even want a scholarship, even if you're not eligible for aid, you have to have a FAFSA form. I get form it. In, so they use it as a proxy for college going. I know. And I totally agree with you. So we have a stupid FAFSA night because it takes literally 15 like minutes. But or, here's the thing, like for people yeah. like me, who my kids go to GCU, um, they already got their scholarship through GCU. They weren't going to get any FAFSA anyway. So from a parent standpoint, I would have been like, why would I fill that out? They're not getting anything. They already got their scholarship through GCU and I don't need that. So they, they can give us points through the ASVAB. <laughs> so, but I'm just saying, like, I knew that I needed to fill it out, right. but no, coming you're right. from Fountain Hills, sure. there's a lot of parents yes. that right. are like... Well, and, and I think that's the other part is we really need to have our counselor who's new understand what's in that CCRI because right. there are, like, taking the AccuPlacer, uh, you get points for that, you get points, you know, 
I, I did I did try to get every senior or I can't remember I, I think it was seniors that took the ASVAB you know and, and 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 it was hard I know parents didn't want recruiting calls and the whole deal but I I you know, was able to say to them listen it's going to give you some great data if you get the calls I will definitely let them know we're not going to you know continue to, if you're going to do that but you know the more kids that, that you can put points in and out of a hundred remember we only have a yeah. hundred kids right. so so if one kid doesn't graduate. You know, two, it, it adds up fast. And yeah. so you don't have a lot of room for error with 100 kids. You really got to get everything right and to get that graduation rate up and get that CCRA where it needs to be. Um, I think it's just more training of our staff of this is why we, we do the things that we do and this is the value. And we're not, yes, you do it because it's for the letter grade, but it's also valuable to the kids. I mean, taking the Accuplacer is good. Taking the ASVAB is good. Absolutely. Filling out a FAFSA is good. Uh, it's just getting more compliance in that because then the state looks at it and says we're really on top of things. And and I'll tell you that the, one of the school districts that does an excellent job on their CCRIs is Glendale Union. Glendale Union, every I think every high school is an A in their in their district, wow. and and it is a lot of it is they are just very very good at um, making sure that all their kids have everything that they need. Um, they're they're great at it. Yeah. And, and is not, not just all for, schools for, categorize dropout. <laughs> so um, it is a, it is a situation where you can play you can play the system. It yeah. is not fair for districts who are small who play by the rules. Right. Um, so we have to be careful, and I think we have to educate families about that. With the letter grade, people need to. How is your child doing? Yes. My child is doing just fine. Yes, maybe I'm disappointed in this letter grade, and yes, I want all children to succeed, and there are ways to get there. But um, the number one predictor of a standardized test score is free and reduced lunch. So I can already tell you how many kids are going to pass based on a free and reduced lunch, probably within a percentage point. Um, it's unfortunate, but it's true because it's test-taking strategies. It's experiences that kids have, um, and we have to be a snapshot in time. Um, it cannot be what defines our school district. We want our kids to do well academically, but we have to be really um, intentional about the message that we send about a standardized test that was taken by a certain group of students over a couple days and what that means. Because we all have Google. Like, standardized tests are, I mean, in the scheme of things, are very outdated. Yeah. Like it's much more important to know to how to get an answer yes. and to critically think about something yes. than to have a formula memorized that you would never really have to know in your job. Yeah, like most of us probably went to school with teachers telling you, well, you have to know how to long, do the long division because you won't always have a calculator in your pocket. Right. And now we do. No, we right. do. <laughs> uh, so I and think I could still look up the Dewey Decimal System, <laughs> but it's obsolete now. <laughs> yeah, like I do statistics every single day. I would have failed with Barcelona's statistics <laughs> because I don't know how to do the formulas, but I certainly know how to go into the computer and set up the coding for it. Right. right. So um, I think that you know, 21st century skills, I loved how you said that about communication, collaboration. Like if we can set up systems where, yeah, they might do great on the ACT, and we want that for our kids, yeah. right? Um, but they're also gaining skills so that That's they're the in the workforce. Thing. It's right. a workforce development skills. When they're in the workforce, they're not going to be in a corner typing away. They're going to have to communicate and make decisions and team build and all of these other things that are going to make them successful. So I just, I, you know, I've been on my soapbox before about standardized tests. And if, if, we, if the data is meaningful, Dr. J, like it used to be for AZ Merit, and you can pull it out and be like, you know what, we really need to focus on these three things to get our test scores up. To me, that is so beneficial. Um, but I just don't, it really makes me sad that we are so tied up on a test that kids take two hours in the morning and two hours in the afternoon and then the next day and that defines our entire district so. well and unfortunately it's that letter grade when somebody's googling mm -hmm. i'm going to move mm -hmm. and they're like oh we would go here because they're a c school like you said it's like how is your students doing how are our students doing are they well-rounded like you know do we have a good <laughs> educational background like 
if the standardized test isn't that great, well, sometimes that happens. And especially if you follow cohorts, which I did for a long time, you know, being on the board for 10 years, I've followed cohorts and I've, I've categorized them. And yeah. there are certain cohorts, my son, no matter what you do, that cohort, doesn't matter what year, doesn't perform well on a standardized and test. And it's, it's our special ed students are, are now required to take tests. They used to get alternative tests. Right. So schools that don't have any special ed students are going to perform uh, better. Of course, they're going to have higher percentages. It's it's. But yeah. well, we have want, to figure out we that want to have a we yes. absolutely absolutely. So, right. yeah. so we I have think, to find that middle ground yeah. where we yeah. still participate and hold our, our test scores and our letter grade, you know, high expectations, high, high expectations, but, but you know, we want your, realistic. I think your goals, though, encompass more than just those specific academic right. things. Yes. I mean, it's about safety and yes. equity and, um, you know, making sure that all students have a, a, and parents and, um, and staff have a great experience at the district and that we are um, doing that within the framework that we have. So I think we can work with that. Carrying on what Wendy said, we can talk about this and stuff. You know, I, I use Urban Day as a club, but I, I, I look at the, uh, we got to prepare our students for their future, not our past. Yes, yes. I love that saying. Can we put that somewhere? <laughs> I really do love that. Saying. I think it would be neat to put it somewhere. Yeah. Um, it, put it on the doors. You know, I, I, people say the same thing back in my architectural days. I said, why are we teaching students how to? Take a 4 H pencil and turn it so it doesn't flatten out um, when we got CAD. <laughs> um, and, and yet, I got beat up uh, in the architectural world because I said that. You know, they're, they're, you have to understand pencil on paper. Well, it's no different than calculator. How, yes. many, how many of us could do a uh, square root uh, by hand? Why? Not often. Who cares? <laughs> you know, Why you probably couldn't. I got a number <laughs> hit the square root key and you got the answer, right? Probably so we have to make too. sure that. Things like you said, critical thinking, are, are ingrained in our students at an early age, not the later years in the system. That um, you know, when it comes to English, for example, whatever you want to read, in my mind, as long as you enjoy reading it, you're going to gain knowledge. Knowledge, right? Um, Absolutely. Whether you can identify a passage out of Moby Dick, who cares, right? Uh, unless you're in a Mr. Why? Bikley might care. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> why? Like, why? Why? Because I'll tell you why. That? I mean, well, why are Mr. we teaching kids in old I, English? I, I tell like, my students. We're we don't read in old English. We don't talk in old English. Why are our kids being demanded to know old English? Like, well, yeah. and the same thing with uh, person, you know, whatever. But uh, those are not things we build a success on. I mean, we build success on the students' ability to move forward in life successfully based on what we did for them at these age groups. Which looks different for every single student. Absolutely right. right. Yes. Every family's different. Yeah. Well, and on our goals, I, I, the only thing that that I would change, yes. or, I'm, I'm not a good wordsmither, though, so that's Wendy's department, <laughs> uh, is that, you know, like we, we say provide a safe and secure environment for students, staff, and visitors that support physical and mental well-being, and, and I believe in that. But... I want to I want to have that environment where they also choose to stay, because we don't have anything in there about retention, okay. and that's a huge issue for us: student retention, teacher retention, staff retention, whatever. We we have a huge issue with that, and so that would probably be either an additional goal or wordsmithing of a goal of providing an environment, you know, a safe and secure environment for students, staff, and visitors that. You know, they yeah come back to come every back. day or whatever. Yeah, figure that out. Yeah, that we don't have anything about people staying, about the longevity, about retention. That you know, somebody in in their that staff document said, "What's the board going to do about teacher retention?" Well, one, we in, unless we know why they leave, we we don't know because we don't know why they leave. So mm -hmm. that's where these documents come in handy. Is that if you tell us why you're leaving, then we can look at how we or Dr. J can fix things. But two, it you know, we don't have, that's not even part of our goal, is to retain I think it's the best, you know, yeah. to retain I, the I students. I love that idea. Work. And, you know, but we can have, I mean, to that point, there are policies that we can have. I mean, we give our bonuses at the end of every year. A lot of schools 
split them up yep. throughout the year. So teachers will say, oh, I'm making, I'm making, you know, $10,000 more if I go to that school. Well, actuality, they're not because they're getting a $10,000 bonus at the end of the year. Or do we, I know some districts, I don't know if they still do this, but you get part of your bonus at the end of the year, and then you get the other part after you've been at the school for another two months. So that you don't have those people leaving in the summer, or if they leave, you know, they don't get their, like we have this they year, they don't take their somebody, bonus so. and then take off and we don't have time uh, to, to hire. Course, like the courts have kind of screwed that up because now if you earned it in the school year, yeah. you get it no matter okay. whether you yeah, come right. back or not. But are there ways that we could set up a retention bonus structure? Like, you know, at Christmas, right. we get this, but you get this dollar amount of bonus if, you know, there are things that we could do to a certain we extent. We did do some bonus. Um, some of the bonuses were revamped as part of the meet and confer, right, Mr. Buckley? And didn't we change some of the, because we used to have this really funky, like, percentage that you got for the retention, and some of it was, like, you got, like, 20 bucks, <laughs> like, because, like, it worked out. It was because it was really weird. I think we made it more of a flat fee structure where, Per year you, that you stay in the district, you get X amount for, per year, right? So, like, I don't remember exactly what it was, but let's say it was $100 per year. So, if you've been here for 10 years, you get an extra $1,000, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, it's very clear and cut and dry and not, like, what percentage based on how long I've been here and what position I'm in do I then get a bonus for? And we talked about that in our board retreat yeah. um, about reassessing contracts to include the 301 monies. Yeah. So, because you're right, like, you know, if you look at, at certain school districts' contracts, it does look like their teachers make a lot more money because their 301 money is included in that where we don't, we pay it separately. Well, yeah, one thing time. we are working on this year, and we talked about this and with some of the other superintendent groups, is that um, Kaylee and Alicia are going to work on the total compensation, yes. you know, uh, document that goes out. Mm -hmm. And because um, in that, you know, for example, yes, when you look at the total compensation, it's a little bit better picture because you might have a higher base maybe somewhere else, but then when you factor in our benefits, okay. I have found are cheaper here um, than, than they are in other districts. That, that, that can really impact your overall pay. Um, and then you factor in there all the stipends. You know, a lot of people are getting different stipends and supplemental contracts and things like that. So to do it at the end of the year where um, those things have all been inputted. So if you do it now, a lot of coaches and things, it wouldn't, it wouldn't show. So right. that's something we're looking for at the end of the, the year to kind of send out. And we, we did do that years ago here. I, I remember that. So we, it's something we just got to continue to do. Yeah. But I think mm -hmm. when you have that full compensation package of how much I'm getting in benefits, what, what my 301 mm -hmm. is, and you see that total number, that, that might change some of the perception. That's good. Yeah. Because yeah. I think people, I, I think staff sees, you know, that contract with that very basic number, and it, it's kind of like sticker shock. So, sure. yeah, especially know. if you're 23, right, 24, and it's the first contract you've ever seen. Well, and, and you're here, you know, looking at the time. hiring things in other districts, and they're like, oh, you can make $10,000 more. Well, but we also have to highlight the things that we're doing well, and like our, our <laughs> elementary classroom numbers are very low. Right. I mean, they're, they're very yeah. good numbers. Kindergarten, 17, right, Chris? 17, 18. I mean, it's, yeah, even. Yeah. It, First grade at nineteen, you know, so so those are those are really good numbers. Counselors, a lot of the districts counselors. five to seven hundred per mm -hmm. caseload right. here, two hundred. So so we need to, as the administrative team, also highlight that these are things that we're doing. Even at the administrative level, I've talked to our principals about that we're we're really serious about you know you being instructional leaders, and we're trying to give them the support to do that. They have. Each site has a, a dean or an assistant principal. Each site has now a security guard. Each site has this counseling position. So, so when you factor all that in, and then you look at your overall enrollment of those school sizes, it really presents an opportunity to to do more than might you might be able to do in a larger school where you just don't have the time to do that. Right. So I, I do want to get that across to people that um, you know. 
you know, our high school is a perfect example of that. There's a lot of support. We have three administrators. Well, we have two counselors budget. We have one now, we'll have a, hopefully a second one soon. We have now two security guards there. Um, so, so you have a lot of, and you have 475 kids, that's a lot of support. Right. Well, I want the community and our staff to see that, that that's a perk of being in this district, is that there is support like that available. And I don't think that always comes across. Support, what is support? I mean, mm -hmm. when a person right. on the street, um, as a former teacher and, and still teacher, uh, that's important to me because I'm never going to be done learning. Yep. And knowing the tools, of, you know, whether it's the LMS or others, um, makes you a better teacher if you take advantage of those tools. So, um, you know, it's not that the principal all job is, is to sit in the office and watch things happen. Uh, they're instructional leaders uh, in most cases. And, and when I was a principal, that was where I spent all my time. Mm -hmm. Because I, we had security and we had uh, other people that were taking care of normal other duties so that I could spend the time in the classroom to support the principal. Yeah, and as the year goes on and they get more and more in the, the rhythm of the year, and um, like I said, um, all three sites are doing a lot of new things that we've asked them to do, and they're doing it, I think, with great fidelity. And I think TJ's, you know, um, you know, the the survey results are showing at least that they're feeling supported. So, so that if that's the goal is to provide support, and then we're seeing that regardless of who the survey is, the current group of teachers felt like, was it? 90 some percent total that they feel supported by their site administration. That's great. Yeah, that is great. So, so, so that, that's how you get retention. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is when they walk away at the end of the year and say, I feel supported. I feel there's a good vibe on campus. I feel that there's the climate is right. And I feel like the administration has the resources to handle the things that come up so I can keep teaching and, and we can have the kind of you know, climate that we want. So I, I think we're really heading in the right direction in those areas with the retention of staff, um, the retention of students, the next committee I'm, I'm going to put together is a marketing committee of our staff of what, what do we, how do we keep our kids here and how do we, how do we get kids to look back at our school if, if in the future they want to come back, what, what can we offer that really sets us apart because um, that, that is, that's the big question is what, and that's what I think about all the time, is what is it that we can do that's different that makes people look back and say, this is this is a good option for me. And I, I want to make sure that we somehow embody in this, that we support teachers. You know, I've heard from a teacher, as you're saying that, we want to keep teachers here, teacher retention, that in some ways it's hard to be a teacher right now because of feeling um, constantly under scrutiny. So as a board, our job is also to protect our employees, uh, you know, our community, um, from whether it is administration, whether it's parents, whether it's other students, whether it's other teachers. But that positive climate needs, I think, we need to make sure that teachers know that we're always going to have their backs. Um, I think that's really important. So maybe that's the other goal, is a positive climate yeah. with the, you know, that leads to retention of all stakeholders because we, we also want parents yeah. we're trying to retain them right mm -hmm. they're the decision makers mm -hmm. right so, and and that's just it and that comes with customer service that comes with the way they're treated at our sites that comes with the response rate of an administration back to them on an email or a phone call when there is a tough situation how that's handled so that they feel you know respected and they feel like it's handled correctly those are all things that keep people here it's it's when those things aren't working right that people say okay now I need to look for something else right. so that that might be the other goal is somehow wordsmith it where it's tied to the climate of the schools mm -hmm. because if it is positive students will want to stay teachers will want to stay and parents will want to stay yeah and administrators you can't forget them because you That's can't correct. keep having turnover yeah, no. of administration yeah. and I'm working very hard with the three principals to say we support you yeah. what do we got to do we want you to be leaders we want you to feel like you you have, you have all the resources that you need. Um, tell us what you need. And then that trickles down to their, their assistance as well. So we'll have a, another goal. Yes, yeah, so six. six. I saw you writing, so I'm assuming you got it down. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, I, I think that's important because yeah. um, I would say out of all of this, I mean, we, we want to have safe, secure campuses. We want to have kids that feel comfortable on campus, but if, if they're not here, we, you know. Retention is, is my biggest concern overall. Right. And that's, it's been an issue for us for many years, sure. but the last couple of years have been significant. Good. So if we can tackle that one, get that right, um, I think then, then, you know, I, I just, and I don't have the data, but I just saw the teacher, um, the new teacher network I was part of last year. You know, they, every time you lose a teacher, the cost to the district is close to $20,000 in training and onboarding and all the things that factor in and so the, the less you have of that and the more consistency you have um, the better and I and I feel like the teams we have in place are, are the right people doing the right things and are heading in the right direction and I'm very happy with all three sites I think they're doing excellent work it's just that a lot of them are new and it's just going to take a little more time uh, for what their big picture is to, to get where they want to be, but they're headed completely in the right direction. When do they release the hard to fill positions? The, um, that, that report. Hmm. Uh, I mean, see, it goes by state, so every state is different on the hard to fill, fill positions. Okay. Because that might be something too in terms of retention. I, I mean, I think it's so important to make sure. That those hard to fill positions continue to receive those stipends, which they is something we time. worked really hard yeah. for as a board yeah. right. they do three it years time. ago. Well, it's usually the ones that you're competing against industry for math and science. And yes, you special math, science, and special But it's ed. becoming more. It's yeah, going to every that teacher every is a hard to fill. <laughs> yeah, because of the lack of, yeah. of individuals going into the profession. Right. But then again, you know, we, we were doing a study on the sub pay long-term sub pay to try to encourage more and more people to look at our district as a place to sub and then from there you get a better pool of long-term subs or retirees that may want to come back for a year and fill in in a tough spot um, it really a lot of a lot of the staffing comes down to who, you, who, who you've made connections with who you can call on the phone and ask to come back sure. because there, there's just not a lot of applicants out there so retention is key in a very tough um, hiring market so we really got to and, and, and I do think that money plays a role in that, but I also think what plays more of a role is how you feel about going to work every day and right. the environment that you work in. Mm -hmm. And so if we can build that to where it needs to be, um, you know, and we can also give raises like we did last year and continue to, to support that and through consolidation and being fiscally responsible, um, I think we have a lot of opportunity to do that. Yeah, no, I agree. You know, money is always going to play a a role. I mean, that's why people work is to make money. But in all the years I've been here, we have not had the turnover that we've had in the past few years. Um, I mean, teachers stayed here, and they stayed here because they either lived here, they liked the small classes. I mean, our retention was pretty good. Um, you know, students, it, it's always kind of been iffy. Um, but teachers, like, it, it's just it's devastating to watch how many teachers left this district, and um, and it and the sad part is they didn't leave because of money. Most of them did not leave because of money. So. We'll move forward and find find solutions. That's right. Yep. Any other suggestions on the goals? Okay. Any other thoughts about um, outlining some board expectations, or do we want to leave that? more open to Dr. J to work on with his administrators to determine um, areas of focus that align with the overarching board goals. I would like to see what Dr. J and his team come up with first before we start putting out our expectations. I think we did that during the SWAT. Um, I, I think he knows where the board stands and, and what's important to us at this point. So. I would like to see what his goals are and, and what his team comes up with and, and what they accomplish during the school year before we start laying out more expectations. Okay, that's my opinion. Um, Dr. J, do you have a plan for when you, like once we wrap up our board goals, which is basically the same ones plus the new one that we just discussed, when you might be able to come back to us and share some thoughts about what you've outlined for your team? 
Yeah, I think the September 14th, we okay. can. can. Our, we have HR deadlines as early as September 15th on um, fall conferences and, and going over, you know, the, um, the TES with them and things like that. So uh, I don't think that's unrealistic for me to get that together and then present it to you. You take a look at it, give feedback, and then from there, present it out to all the team. Great. All right. Um, the last thing we have here is just individual goals. Um, this was not, uh, the individual goals weren't anything that we made, like, posted publicly. It was more just so that we as individual board members would, you know, think about our involvement on the board and what we could do, not just in the board meetings on a monthly basis, but as part of the wider school community. Um, I know I did not achieve all of my board goals. I did much better the first part of the school year than I did the latter part of the school year <laughs> last year um, with other things that we had going on. Um, but those would still be my goals for this year. Um, does anybody have, uh, it's not, like I said, this, they're not published. It's more of personal thing, personal yeah. thing mm -hmm. you know, just something to aim for um, to get ourselves more out in the community hopefully, or, um, you know, work more with, uh, we talk about what we can and can't do as board members, right? Um, so I was going to say work more within the school community, but not work, right? Because we don't How about work listen? in the schools. Listen yes. more to the school get community. Get more <laughs> yes, yes. Get more exposure to what's going on in the school community um, and not overreach uh, our duties as board members. Which... I really, um, I've tried to make the copy with Kane, but um, with my health and our construction, it's been a little difficult. But I do plan on starting to attend those, but I'd also like to attend the one at the high school. So if you can let me know when he's doing that, because I don't get, I, I don't think I know him. So the, or the coffees, um, all the coffees will be on our district events calendar, which pops up on our website. Perfect. So if you go to the then website, everything okay. for each one of the sites will show up on our district website. Actually, all the websites. Okay. The website's looking beautiful, Krista. Yeah. I went on there the other day to look for something, and... No, I mean, thank you. The, no, the, the blocks with the times and the dates, like, on the main website, that's yeah. probably auto-populated. Yeah. And it's somewhere here. And the high school marquee sticks. Yeah. Oh, great. Right. Very nice. Um, will Dr. Uh, Wheeldryer or... Mr. Wilkinson be doing the copies as well? Yes. So I just got um, Dr. Wheeldryer's first date today. I feel like it's going to be August 31st, but I will confirm that tomorrow. And um, I've asked Michelle to get that on that, get it on the calendar. So she'll set it up for every three weeks. All the sites will do every three, every three weeks. weeks. Yeah. Unless there's and they'll a be on a different or, day. Yeah. On different yeah. days. Yeah. 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 Yes. So that's the other thing. Is, yeah. <laughs> we can't all be at the same time. Same time. Same day. So, <laughs> Yes. So, speaking of speaking of, we might want to how you did last year, where it was just um, the forum for the football games and the coffees right. and all of that, because it, it sounds like they're probably has so I have one. Um, it's standard on the website. Oh, it um, is under the governing okay. board, okay. and it kind of covers all of those. Okay, okay. Yeah. I knew you did it last year. I didn't know if it needed yeah. to be updated. Right. Um, yeah, I, maybe I will add like coffees to it, um, but it has like sporting events and, and um, events. site events yeah. and community events, and so. Okay, yeah. But I can be okay. specific with the coffee since there's going to be so many. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm going to strike a relationship with the ghetto resident. <laughs> <laughs> you go do that. Dr. J wasn't here for that. I don't no, think. What are we gonna do with you? <laughs> I'll have to find the recording. And yeah, <laughs> it, it was during and the whole totally land funny. discussion when yeah. they mentioned um, the new community and how it's more like the, the ghetto. And ghetto. That's where Dana lives. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't know that that so was where Dana lives. That, that's you know. He's so we joke about yes. it all the time, living in the ghetto. He's yeah. been in the ghetto. Yeah. yeah. So all right. you know, it is. 
Well, that concludes uh, <coughs> what we had on our agenda, future action. If you have an item that you'd like to see on a future board meeting, you can reach out to Krista. Our next board meeting will be on Wednesday, September 14th. If that is a business meeting at 6 p.m. And then following that, we have a Wednesday, September 28th work study session at 5 p.m. Both of those meetings will be here in the FHUSD Learning Center. And with that, I move that we adjourn. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Uh, are there any opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. Okay, so what is it? So, Judy, so are you saying that, that you can't what open goes it in there? Do you want oh. to keep it and, and so put it in? Oh, it's in the binder. Uh, yes. Do so you know how blocked that would get in my house right now? I will just leave it for you. And sometime in October, do you...